half in the bag. Hey, don't you got anything better to do? What about Bob? Speed? Keanu Reeves movie? Pay it forward? Mike? Yeah? Do you think it's smart to still be here? Why? Did you pass gas? Is there a gas leak? Something to do with gas? No, because last time we saw Mr. Plinkett, he called us out on our scam. I don't even think we're still working for him. You know what's the weird part? Is that I haven't seen Mr. Plinkett for a day or two now. I think it's time to come clean, Mike. I think we need to tell Mr. Plinkett that we haven't been working on his VCR, and maybe, maybe even let him know that VHS has been a dead technology for at least 15 years. I don't know, Jay. I like where you're going with the whole VCR thing. Maybe we could pretend to be AV guys and we're coming to install his new home theater system and we could take a couple years to do it. It'll be a whole new scam. Mike, no more scams. Yeah, this does feel kind of pathetic. Maybe you're right, Jay. I tell you what, let's go see a movie. We'll come back and if Mr. Plinkett's here, we'll, you know, have a talk with him and come clean. Sounds good. What movie should we see? How about uh, Oz, The Great and Powerful? Is that the movie starring Melissa McCarthy as an eccentric character spouting weird things and doing wacky improv? Yes. Oh, if ever, oh ever a wist there was, the Wizard of Oz is one because, 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 because. Because of the wonderful things he does. Do, Mike. Do, 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 Mike. Do, Mike. Do. What? That's not the movie we just saw. Oh, right. What I meant was... Hey, look. What? The VCR is gone. Not this wire here. That goes to this one over here. But what are these stuff? I don't know. I don't know. I could go anywhere. Mr. Plinkett? What? 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 Who's there? Who's there? What are you doing? Uh, uh, I'm trying to fix my VCR, but I have to get in its head first. I have to take it apart. I have to figure out how it works. Uh, okay. I gotta, gotta, gotta figure it out. Gotta, gotta fix, 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 fix. Hey, Plinkett's acting kind of strange, isn't he? Yes, Jay. Yes, he is. Step this way! See the most wondrous sights imaginable! Kansas is full of good men. I don't want to be a good man. I want to be a great one. You're gonna need this! Oz the Great and Powerful is a prequel to the classic 1939 MGM musical The Wizard of Oz. Or maybe it's just an adaptation of another one of the L. Frank Baum 13 Wizard of Oz books. I don't know, it's something. Whatever, you've heard the name Oz, so here's another movie about it. In this film, we see how a phony magician traveling through Kansas gets whisked away to the magical land that shares his name, and how he eventually becomes the Wizard of Oz we've all come to know. In order to take his place as the new king of this magical land, Oz must first defeat the evil Wicked Witch and her army of flying baboons. Will Oz defeat the Wicked Witch? Will he fall in love with Mila Kunis or Michelle Williams? How close can a studio get to infringing on Warner Brothers copyright? All these questions and more are answered in Oz, the not so great and not so powerful. Mike, what did you think of Oz the Great and Powerful? You know, I, I mentioned last time we saw a movie, and the last movie we saw was Jack and the Giant Beanstalk. Jack the Giant Slayer. Whatever. I saw Jack and the Giant Beanstalk, and I'm like, I don't give a flying fuck about Jack and the Giant Beanstalk. Um, and then I sat down and I watched it, and it won me over, and I thoroughly enjoyed it. This movie, I kind of wanted to punch it in the face a couple times, and then sometimes it was like, oh, that's kind of neat. Do you think it wasn't just James Franco you wanted to punch in the face? I wanted to punch a lot of people in the face in this movie, but I mean, I'm not 
I'm not angry about it. I mean, that's, that's one thing I think we should get out right off the bat, is that um, there, there, no one needs to complain that this movie ruined The Wizard of Oz or it somehow does anything like that, because there have been a million different movies about Oz, and it doesn't matter anymore. Well, and sequels to the original book. Yeah. Like just an endless series of sequels to The Wizard of Oz in book form, in movie form, yeah. adaptations, the Muppet Wizard of Oz with uh, Quentin Tarantino for some reason. Um, <laughs> I don't know if he played the wizard, I never saw it, but yeah, just lots and lots of, it's, it's just one of those things that there's just gonna be an endless supply of. And it also wasn't the first Wizard of Oz movie. There was already a version of it before that one, so, so whatever. A series has been raped since the beginning of film. Yeah, I mean, remaking The Wizard of Oz with Dorothy and uh, the, the lion and all those characters is kind of taboo. Yeah. You know, it's kind of like remaking Gone with the Wind or Citizen Kane or something along those lines, um, which they didn't really do, so. I, I, I think there's two ways to look at this movie. One is as just a general audience family movie that tries to uh, pay respect to the original Wizard of Oz movie and sort of complement it as its own story. And I, I think in that respect, most general audiences will like it. Mm -hmm. uh, we saw it with a lot of kids and they seem to be enjoying it, laughing at the silly monkey and all that stuff. So I think I'm, in that respect, it succeeds. I don't give a fuck about kids or families or family movies at all. So the other way to look at it is as a Sam Raimi movie. Uh, Sam Raimi has been one of my favorite uh, filmmakers. Uh, he's actually the person that made me want to get into filmmaking. So I was watching this as a movie I couldn't care less about as far as a Wizard of Oz prequel and just sort of watched it for those little Sam Raimi moments and things that I sort of like about his style. And there ended up being more of it in this than I would have expected, which I was pleasantly surprised by. Emerald City. You are here at last, and the prophecy shall be fulfilled. This is my sister, Evanora. I'm here to serve you. The royal treasure of Oz. It belongs to you. He has such a, a, a casual attitude about the fact that he's making movies. He knows what he's doing is not important in the grand scheme of the world, and when you watch one of his movies, you, you never forget that you're watching a movie. And there's sort of a, a, like you said, quaintness to that, sort of a, it feels sort of like a throwback to, to old Hollywood. Mm -hmm. And that's an aspect of his movies that I appreciate. He's always had this attitude where, I mean, the first Evil Dead movie exists, he made a horror movie, he has, didn't have much interest in horror movies, he made it because it was a, a genre that you can sell very easily, and for your first movie, that's what you're gonna do. So he's always had this quality to him of, just sort of trying to please an audience, whatever audience it's going to be. Mm. Please an audience and make back the money for the people that are willing to pay for your film. He's always had that sort of uh, mentality about him. So it goes all the way from Evil Dead to this. So it's just saying, a much larger scale movie. So you're saying he's not really an artist? Yeah, he's per, not. Per se. And, he's and a, he's, he's never, I, I mean, I would say Evil Dead 2 is a fucking work of art, but he's yeah. never had any sort of uh, pretense about what he's doing. There's a book I've had since I was a little kid, since I first got into uh, the Evil Dead movies called uh, Filmmaking on the Fringe. I have no idea if it's still in print, but it's just interviews with all these B-movie directors. Mm -hmm. And uh, Sam Raimi got his start with the Coen brothers. They collaborated and worked on stuff together. And the interviewer asked, like, how do you feel about the fact that the Coen brothers are now making these, these critically acclaimed movies, these really great films that you know, play film festivals and you're just a hack, basically. And he's like, I don't care. Like, I, I make movies to entertain an audience and please the people that are willing to give me money to make movies. So I, that, that complete lack of, of pretense about what he's doing is, is sort of refreshing for a filmmaker. I guess the job of most directors and storytellers is to just give the audience what they need, the seed, and let them grow the story in their mind and come in here with a little bit of water and let them grow some more and put a little sunshine in. And that's what I tried to do, was try to just find those pieces that they needed. It's, I kind of feel like the character of Oz is similar to Sam Raimi in a lot of ways, where he's just like this little man behind the curtain that's like pulling, pulling levers, levers and pulling yeah. cords and just trying to please an audience that he's is way beyond his reach, you know? <laughs> he's at his best when he's working with smaller 
films. And that's why I'm saying, like, this movie, I, I really didn't care about it all that much, but it, I, I was watching it more from the perspective of, like, what's he going to try and work into this to make it feel a little more personal than some of these type of movies usually do? Towns were destroyed. <laughs> Children were orphaned. Great wizard from Kansas. I've waited for you to come and set things right. Uh, I mean, if I were to just encapsulate what I didn't like about the movie, it felt... It felt very clever, um, but it didn't feel like magical. No, it didn't. It's just so magical. It didn't have that that element from the first one, um, and I got the angle. Like he, the wizard's a fraud, and he has to prove himself, and you know he he becomes Oz the Great and powerful in the end. And um, yeah, he oddly enough ends up being a very Sam Raimi type lead character. Like there's yeah. not too many differences between him and Ash, which I thought was interesting. Yeah, yeah. Actually, this whole movie kind of felt like a, a Army of Darkness for little kids. There's a lot of similarities to the structure, which I thought was funny. Yeah, yeah. Is traveling, that whole, traveling to another land. Traveling to another land, being considered this uh, much greater than you really are. And then yeah. there's that montage sequence where they're uh, getting ready to battle the mm, evil yeah, witch in her yeah. army. And it's like, just like that sequence in Army of Darkness. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you'll die, you'll die! Did those crows just say we're gonna die? What really drags this movie down is that almost every role is completely miscast. Yes. Almost every performance in this movie is bad. And they're not all bad actors. They're just not right for these parts. Right. And the, the, the corny Sam Raimi tone, I think they didn't know what to do with it. Um, yeah. They, they, I, except for Michelle Williams. Michelle she, she Williams. She was good as Glenda Williams. the Good Witch, yeah. like whatever. But I, I agree with you on the, the, the ending the, or the battle stuff. Like, that's what I, that's the clever stuff in the movie. Yeah. I didn't see the, the, uh, Alice in Wonderland movie, but that just devolves into a dumb battle. Uh, yeah. A lot of these movies do. This, that's this... the that's the the structure for these type of films now, right. unfortunately. And at yeah. least this one kind of subverted it a little. It bit. had a um, it had a very clever way of of putting action and adventure into the movie, which stayed true with the character. It's a good script. Yeah. Um, a uh, wizard has to prove himself, but he's you know a fraud, and he he's a con man, and he knows magic, illusions, trickery. And uh, that's all put to use in the film. It's not just, come on, everybody, let's fight the big monster. Right. Which, you know, that, that, that was all the stuff that I liked. Um, especially the ending. We don't want to give away the ending and what he does at the end. And you're like, oh, okay. It's that's, satisfying. Uh, that's, that's the story satisfying. level, it's satisfying. Yeah. Um, but if we're going to talk about the actors now, let's talk about the actors. The whole thing was magical. I, you know, I, it was a long shoot, but... I loved, you know, working with Sam again and all the other actors. It was, um... James Franco, uh, I don't think anyone likes him. <laughs> and, and yet he stars in feature films, especially after his Oscar uh, debacle. He's very weird. I think his whole career is like performance art because he's like a weird artist type uh -huh. and he does these little art shows and weird things and then he stars in these big movies mm -hmm. and he just looks like he doesn't belong, like he doesn't want to be there. I, I would say he's better in this than he was in the Planet of the Apes movie. There, he just looked like he was ready to fall asleep at any time yeah. or, or just wanted to go uh, smoke some weed or something. Uh, he's okay in the, the kind of smaller moments in this movie, but when he's supposed to be playing like the, the huckster, con man, womanizer stuff, he's just, he's just making that dumb grin and you just want to punch him. Yeah, yeah, he has the, the stoner face uh, and he has kind of, sort of a, a marble mouth syndrome, mush mouth syndrome. M m I, li I like Mila Kunis, I mean, was, since we're on the subject of who's in this movie, Mila Kunis is good. She's a very good actress. Um, I, I thought she was better than Natalie Portman in Black Swan. Um, Natalie Portman sucks uh, in that movie. Uh, uh, that's my opinion. I don't want to go off on a tangent here. <laughs> Mila, Mila Kunis stole that movie. I, I, yeah, I, I Portman, think she was better too. A good movie was imprinted on her and everyone focuses the attention on her. She's brilliant in Black Swan, not that. <laughs> no, she just moped around. Mila Kunis did a great job in Black Swan, and she's really talented. But she does, uh, her and James Franco, do all these shit movies. And I, I, I see her in movies like that, and I see James Franco in, like, the, the stoner comedies, Pineapple Express, and... Yeah. Which is the type of role he should be playing. Yeah. He's fine in that and movie, then but... I, 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 you mentioned Army of Darkness. A young Bruce Campbell 
in a row like this. God, it it would have been great, yeah. Like doing the the um, the nineteen twenties voice, or mm-hmm. come on, guys, let's go. Uh, I'm a I'm a huckster. Come on. And James Franco is James Franco in every movie. Viewers will experience a fantastical world and a great story. Speaking of Natalie Portman, that I kind of got the in Mila Kunis in this movie. I got the Natalie Portman in the prequels vibe during the first half of the movie. Oh, yeah. Where she kind of doesn't seem to know what's going on, just saying words. And then, I guess without getting into spoilers, she kind of goes through a transformation throughout the movie. And then in the second half of the movie, she's just terrible. Well, speaking of prequels, um, there was indeed a cartoon monkey in this movie Mm -hmm. uh, that they meet in the woods that they rescue. And uh, (laughs) the first thing he says is, Misa, are you a life death? (laughs) And and then I went, oh, Fuck. I couldn't believe that nobody said, you know, this is really close to the Phantom Menace. Maybe we should change some of this dialogue a bit. I might not actually be a wizard. Yes, but they don't know that. You are capable of more than you know. Help, please! Are you the great man we've been waiting for? I think the main problem with this movie is there aren't any charismatic actors. In it. That's what drags it down, yeah. That's the big problem. It's it's James Franco, and I, I don't know why he was cast, maybe because he's friends with uh, Sam Raimi from being in the, the Spider-Man, Spider-Man movies, yeah. but you need an actor who has some real charm and charisma and can do a range. James yeah. Franco has no range as an yeah. actor. He just mumbles words, and I think he is doing it as a joke, being a Hollywood actor as, as some sort of weird performance art. I don't know how how he uh, is a box office draw in any way. I, I don't, yeah, I don't know. He doesn't come off as a guy who would actually have his own uh, magic show at a, a traveling circus, you know? He comes off as basically James Franco in a top hat. He's just uh, just phoning in his performance. What? Plinkin. I gotta put this back now. I gotta get that, that, goes, that goes here. Mike, I think Mr. Plinkin is smoking meth. He's got a little pipe there and a baggie filled with white powder. There's sores all over his face and he's acting really strange. Well, of course he's smoking meth. Isn't it great? It means we could run our scam all over again. He's the one breaking his own VCR now. Who's he gonna get to fix it? These guys. I don't know, Mike. This looks pretty serious. Ah, whatever. He's old. He's gonna die soon anyways. In fact, we once tried to throw him off a bridge. And we've tried to murder him numerous times. Why do you suddenly care now? Look, Mike, this time it's different, okay? This time the storyline demands it. Oh, right. You want to talk some more about Oz the Great and Powerful? What? Did we watch that? I think they should have delayed the release of this movie um, because of that that uh, hot air balloon tragedy that happened in Egypt. Ooh, yeah, too I mean, soon. I watched too it soon. and I was like, "That's all I could think about." It really, it's really insensitive of the filmmakers of The Wizard of Oz to do that. Insensitive. They're exploiting that tragedy, and I really think they should have cut all the scenes with the hot air balloon. Each background person has been personally designed. The hair and the costume, the makeup, it all fits as if it was meant to be on that person. They go to Lollipop Land, yeah, and there are no midgets there except for five. There's like five, up. yeah. Why are there grown-ups there? I'm sorry, midgets are grown-ups. <laughs> Pardon my my. Although slip-up. you can't actually, you shouldn't say midgets. You have to say little people. Munchkins? How about Munchkins? Well, let's call them Munchkins. Sure. How, why are there no Munchkins there? There, there's a, a, a handful. There's like a dozen munchkins just so they can have a nod to it. But I, I don't know if they thought it would be weird to have a city full of munchkins in this day and age, like politically incorrect or... Mm, yeah. The house began to pitch and the kitchen took a fish. And then the dog go pick the fish in the middle of a ditch. Well, turn on a healthy situation for the wicked witch. That, that's what I was thinking. My, my two thoughts were, one, it's they're going to worry that it's politically incorrect. Right. Um, and two is that in Hollywood, it's probably more expensive to hire little people. They probably charge more yeah. than, than regular, just generic extras. Yeah. You don't have to pay them anything. You pay them like minimum wage. Um, but munchkins, uh, little people, probably charge an arm and a leg. No pun intended. You're to see the wizard. No wonder 
Well, Jay, what did you think of, uh, 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 what did we watch? Yes. Would you recommend it? No. Did you just, say, did you just answer for me? Uh, not really. I mean, if you followed the career of Sam Raimi and you're curious, whatever. That's, that's kind of, like I said, that's what I got out of it, was just watching it as a Sam Raimi movie. Are you kidding and seeing me? what what he could put in there in yeah. the, the, the grander scheme of a larger scale movie like this. Uh, I, I hope he stops. Well, you have to be like a hardcore Sam Raimi fan to watch this because you're following the career of Sam Raimi. It's, it's, you know, it's the only reason I was curious to see this. Yeah. If he didn't direct it, I would have not cared I, at all about watching this movie. Yeah, I, I got 5% Sam Raimi out of this movie. Like, it just seemed like a big budget Disney kids yeah. movie to me. So. Well, that's, that's... And that's who I would recommend it to. Is like if you got kids or a family, it's 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 pretty safe. It's 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 safe. It's not offensive, but it's also a little better than most kids' entertainment today. Yeah, yeah, and that, and I think that's what Sam Raimi brings to it. Is yeah. a little slower pace. Um, it's not like like you said, the dumb Madagascar movies where everyone's yelling and screaming. And right. Like, oh, 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 oh. There's Tim a pop Burton. song. and Yeah, it's not the chipmunk movie. Right. It's a little smarter than, than those kinds of movies and less less pathetic. Yeah. Um, so for that, it's, it's good, and it's very clever. Um, but for me, the, the, the sense of adventure, wonderment, the, the magic that the original had, and I'm not comparing this to the original because that would be wholly unfair, um, <laughs> but the, it missed the music, it missed the adventure. I, I recently watched the original Wizard of Oz, and it, you know, needless to say, it holds up. Sure. Because it's held up for 90 years. <laughs> um, so uh, that movie, though, is a special movie, and this is just uh, box office cash grab schlock. Yeah, basically. That's, that's harsh, that's <laughs> harsh. It's a good movie, it's fine. So as a contrast to Oz the Great and Powerful, we decided to watch uh, Return to Oz. Yes. A, I think, mostly forgotten uh, Oz movie from the 80s. Yeah, we, we watched this movie because uh, technically it's a sequel to Wizard of Oz. Not really, but and uh, uh, Oz the Great and Powerful is a prequel. So we figured we'd watch the prequel and the sequel and uh, compare and contrast notes on them. And they are both very different films. To say the least, yeah. Yeah, Return to Oz is a, a depressing nightmare. It's the most depressing movie you will ever see. Well, that's not true, actually. That would be Bucky Larson, Born to be a Star. Oh. But for a kid's film, Return to Oz is very, very dark and depressing. I don't know if I would say it's a completely successful movie, but it's a more interesting movie, definitely. Yeah. It has its problems, like any movie has its problems. Yeah. But I like the, um, well, let's, let's, let's mention the premise uh, for those who don't know. It, it takes place six months after Dorothy has uh, gone to Oz, and she, the movie starts off with her lying in her bed in a deep depression. Looking like she wants to kill herself, yeah. Yeah, and her parents are talking about um, how she's uh, mentally deranged because she keeps talking about a place called Oz, so their solution is to, to take her to a doctor to have her get electroshock therapy on her brain in a psychiatric hospital. Yes, they leave her there overnight and she has to lay in her bed and listen to people in other rooms screaming in horrible pain. Yeah, so they strap her to a table. Why do you have to tie me down? You mentioned watching it, you, you're picturing Judy Garland. And yeah, I was, just, I was just picturing Judy Garland being strapped out to a table and brought into a room where they're about to shock her brain, but giving the same type of performance she gave in the original movie. Yeah. That would have been wonderful. So it it's starts off kind of dark. It continues on. She, she gets to Oz by drowning in a river. Um, and then uh, during a, a, a thunderstorm, yeah. Um, when apparently the psychiatric hospital burned to the ground and everyone died while she was in Oz. Uh, and then she wakes up in Oz and at the spot where her original house landed, uh, which was in the lollipop land or whatever, and uh, it's like overgrown forest and everything's destroyed. The yellow brick road is torn up for some reason. Just completely demolished, yeah. And uh, uh, the Emerald City is uh, was attacked by a nuclear bomb. 
Everyone's turned to stone. People have their heads cut off. The cowardly lion committed suicide. Yeah. So, uh, but with that all said, uh, this movie was made in the mid '80s, probably during the era of uh, the darker children's fantasy movies, a la Never Ending Story, Dark Crystal. There's probably numerous other ones. Labyrinth, those type of movies. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, and and that was that was interesting because. I liked that element of it. I, I remember watching um, Never Ending Story as a kid and getting kind of scared at parts, mm -hmm. especially like when the, the horse gets sucked in quicksand. Oh my God, it's horrifying. Yeah, yeah. and it's, it's sad and it's scary, but, it, but all those are, um, are elements of a fantasy adventure. Mm -hmm. Being scared, being terrified by something that's 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 truly frightening, uh, adventure, excitement, all that is is encapsulated in an adventure, and that they don't make stuff like that anymore. No, no. I was thinking about that in comparison to the new Oz movie. Yeah. No, in this new one, no one ever really feels like they're in danger. Everything's everything's bright and colorful and fun. Uh, and then this movie, uh, Return to Oz, everything is turned to shit. Uh, Oz is a drab, depressing, dark place. There's these Wheeler characters that are creepy, and then there's the uh, princess lady that takes off her head and has a cabinet full of heads, and they're all alive, and they're all looking around, and it's, it's like nightmare fuel. But all that existing makes the ending more satisfying when things turn around and you have a happy ending. Yeah, it, it, it falls in line with, with true children's fairy tale stories, which we, we really didn't touch on when we watched fairy tale movies, is that children's fairy tales have always been a little dark and it's because they're meant to teach children a lesson. The boy who cried wolf, he gets eaten by a wolf at the end. Yeah. Uh, the lesson is don't lie. <laughs> right. Uh, um, and there's all these like terrifying things that happen in, in, in children's fairy tales. And, and that's why I liked Return to Oz was because it, it, I think it, it makes you well-rounded as a kid. Yeah. If you have other emotions other than everything's a happy rainbow, right. which is today's society and kids today. Every, like playgrounds are made out of foam. Everyone's always scared and, and everything for kids is, is super sanitized and, and in this cozy, warm bubble of protection. There is, there is nothing that's really uh, edgy or dark or anything for kids. And, and that's what I liked about that movie. And they don't make them like that. No, they, they're still, I mean, you could go back even farther and talk about like the old Disney, the old Disney movies like Pinocchio where all the kids are turning into donkeys and it's terrifying and there's things yeah. like that. And there are elements in some modern movies like that, mm -hmm. but not it still to the, exists. It still exists, but not to the extent. Like I think of uh, The Incredibles. There's that moment in The Incredibles where the mom is in the cave with the two kids and she flat out tells them like, there are people out there grown-ups that'll fucking kill you. So there are little moments like that in, in movies that have, still have respect for kids as young adults in a way that a movie like Oz the Great and Powerful and like those Madagascar movies and stuff like that that is just generic, bland, like everything's friendly and kitty. Um, and I mean, there's always been movies like that too, but it, it seems to be less so now with the darker stuff. But at least it sticks with you. Uh, I remember watching Return to Oz as a kid uh, up until we just watched it. Now, I hadn't seen it since I was a kid, but there's so many things about it that were just like burned into my brain mm -hmm. because because they're horrifying. Scary moments. Yeah. And, darker and moments. Darker moments. And I can't imagine any kid remembering m magic fond memories of Oz the Great and Powerful. No, uh, I can't remember anything that happened in the movie. Yeah, well, we're adults rainbows. and you have a different perspective, but sure. there's not those moments that make you say, oh shit, our heroes are really in trouble and they're at that dark point in their adventure. And there really isn't that. Speaking of Oh, things, look at that, there's fucking E.T. right there. This just happens to be sitting here. This is a good example, um, 1981, 82, 83, uh, something like that. Um, the, the notorious incident where the re-release re of this movie, Steven Spielberg had the guns yeah. of, of the FBI agents replaced with uh, flowers or yes. walkie-talkies. Walkie flowers and balloons. Walkie-talkies. But I haven't seen this movie since I was a kid. 
Um, I, I, and I remember everything about it. I, I, especially the part where E.T. fucking dies. <laughs> and that would never happen now. Yeah. I remember the creepy guys in the biohazard suits and the tube. The, they keep Elliot in a, a quarantine contamination area and E.T. dies on the operating table and then they're going to cut him up. Mm -hmm. and, and, and he turns gray and... And then it's sad at the end when he leaves. If they made this movie today, E.T. would be a wacky hip hop alien with <laughs> sideways hat. The, the thing that makes the lighter m elements in movies like E.T. or Return to Oz more satisfying is getting through the scary stuff. To this day, I don't know how it ends. What happens? What happens? Damn, damn building. Damn, damn building. And Roz, we had a part, you mother, mother, who are things. Put this back, get back in there. It's dying. It's dying. This isn't funny anymore. Dying. I gotta get this thing in working order because nothing's in order. Everything's in chaos. Chaos. Mr. Plinkett. Don't worry. We're gonna get you the help you need. Oh, thank you, Jay. It, it all started off so innocently. I was, I was walking down the street and they told me the first one's free, but the other ones weren't. I, I can admit it now. I have a meth addiction. Hi, I'm actor Rich Evans, co-star of the hit web series, Half in the Bag. On our show, sometimes we make light of some very serious situations, but there is one topic that's never funny, meth addiction. If you or somebody you know is on meth, please call this number. Thank you. Ow, oh, God, ow, oh, who fucking left that?